Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. Join us for an interactive verse-by-verse study of the Bible with one of Orthodoxy's most respected biblical scholars. Study along with us and share your comments and questions by calling 855-237-2346. That's 855-237-2346. Here now is Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Illumine our hearts, O Master who loves mankind, with the pure light of thy divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds to understand thy gospel teachings. Implant in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments, that trampling down all carnal desires, we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things that are well-pleasing to thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, and to thee we ascribe glory, together with thy Father who is from everlasting, and thine all-holy and good and life-giving Spirit, now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Welcome, dear brothers and sisters, to Search the Scriptures Live. I'm Dr. Jeannie Constantino, and today's date is September 18th, 2023. Today's lesson is being pre-recorded, so there's no opportunity for any live calls this evening, just so that you know about that. We are in the middle of uh, St. Matthew's Gospel. Well, not quite the middle. We're in chapter 10, but we're well into it. And this chapter traditionally is called the Missionary Discourse. We already discussed last week whom the Lord sent out. He sent the 12. To whom were they sent? To the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Not to the Gentiles and not to the towns of the Samaritans. And we also discussed what were they to say and to do. They were to preach that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. They were supposed to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons. Now, he also gave a number of other instructions about how they were to conduct themselves on this journey, on these missionary journeys. And it was sort of a trial run, a practice run for them to become accustomed to doing this kind of work while the Lord was still alive. And we had mentioned also that St. Matthew and the other evangelists also who talk about this, which are Mark and Luke, talk about how the Lord gave them authority over illness and demons, etc. So he sent them out with further instructions about how they were to comport themselves. So let's take a look at that. And this is St. Matthew's Gospel, beginning in chapter 10, beginning here at verse 9. Take no gold, nor silver, nor copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it, and stay with him until you depart. As you enter the house, salute it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it shall be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Wow, that's quite an amazing uh, statement at the end there. So we're going to talk about each of these details. So first of all, perhaps the most striking and one of the one of the verses that has been quoted the most frequently is the statement you have received without paying, give without paying. In other words, usually it's rendered as freely you have received, freely give. And this is one of the most important principles that we see in church history and this is one of the reasons why there's an absolute condemnation of charging for things like divine services and for sacraments. We're not never supposed to sell the grace of God. It's always supposed to be given for free. Freely you have received, freely you have freely give. That is, the disciples didn't pay money to Jesus, 
for the grace that they received, for the authority that they received to cast out demons, to heal the sick, etc. So they should not charge other people for it. So one of the worst sins in uh, the church is the, the sin of simony, or some people pronounce it simony, S-I-M-O-N-Y, and that is charging money for uh, for sacraments and things like this. This is one of the worst sins. So um, the first thing he does here is tell them not to receive any money, not to, and also not just for the, what they're going to do, but not to take any of their own money on the journey, no gold or silver or even copper. So what's behind that? And then in, in addition to not even carry sandals or not take sandals or extra clothing or not even a staff. So some people have said, well, he wants them to be able to travel light. Okay. He also says, don't take even a bag. They're not to carry anything at all. I think it's much more than simply emphasizing the urgency of the mission. When people interpret the, interpret the, uh, the Bible, the gospel here, we see the same instruction in Luke and Mark as well. When modern interpreters do interpret it, they usually say things like, well, this is because the mission is urgent and they have to travel light. Um, and there has to be a priority to the preaching of the kingdom. Well, they're sort of right about the priority, but when the fathers of the church talk about this, they talk about it because they say that the reason why this was necessary is to have a lack of attachment to material possessions. So it's not simply that it's not that they couldn't carry one bag, an extra set of clothing is not going to weigh you down so much. One tunic we're talking about, you know, that's our main article is like saying, don't even take a pair of pants and a shirt. Don't take a set of underwear. Take nothing with you. Don't even take a couple of coins in your belt. That's not going to slow you down. So the um, the instructions by the Lord against them carrying anything and not taking any money with them has to do with the lack of attachment to material possessions and the fact that they were to remain completely dependent on God for everything. And of course, isn't that the case with Jesus? Jesus didn't say, I, where's my money? I need some money before I travel from, you know, Cana to Capernaum. He was not concerned about that. And he didn't worry about traveling with extra clothes. So he, they're modeling themselves after him. Let's see what St. Jerome says about this particular passage. Here is St. Jerome in his commentary on Matthew. Lest it turn out that no one believe these rustic men, unschooled and illiterate, and lacking the charm of eloquence, who are promising the kingdom of heaven, he gives them power, cure the sick, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. Thus the greatness of the signs will prove the greatness of the promises. And because spiritual gifts are always demeaned if wages intervene, he adds a condemnation of avarice. Freely you have received, freely give. I, your teacher and Lord, give you this free of charge, and you are to give free of charge, lest the grace of the gospel be corrupted. So first of all, St. Jerome mentions the fact that they were given these powers in order to preach and the kingdom and for people to pay attention to their message because these are just ordinary people they were not people of great renown of great um you know pedigree from their family they weren't educated man they're not among the scribes and the pharisees because they the disciples were all going to to jewish villages so what does he give them to have people pay attention to their message and that was that ability to work miracles but if they were to charge for what they were doing, of course, that's unthinkable, right? But even if, if they were, that would cheapen the grace of the gospel and the message. So as Jerome continues, he talks about the instruction of the Lord not to possess gold, silver, or copper in your belts. This command is consistent with what he had previously said to the evangelizers of the truth. Freely you have received freely give. For if they preach in such a way that they do not accept pay, the possession of gold and silver coins is superfluous. For they 
if they had not if they had gold and silver they would seem to be preaching not for the sake of human salvation but rather for the sake of gain he who decapitates wealth practically cuts off what is necessary for life thus the apostles the teachers of the true religion who were instructing that all things are governed by providence show that they themselves take no thought for tomorrow. Don't take even a wallet for the journey, the Lord said. By this precept, he convicts the philosophers who are commonly called the cynics, because as despisers of the world, they considered all things as nothing and took the pantry along with them. So here Jerome's talking about, uh, as I mentioned last week, this was a common thing that to have um, philosophers, wandering philosophers and teachers, the ones that were most famous for this, uh, who would go from town to town, were the cynic philosophers. And they were kind of known for being scraggly and unkempt and having long hair and uh, an unkempt beard. And they were showing that they didn't have attachment to possessions, but they did have possessions and they traveled with those possessions. So <laughs> Jerome says they took their pantry with them. They took a lot of things with them is what he's saying. They were preaching that they had no attachment <laughs> to possessions. And yet they were actually, um, they were actually carrying a lot of different kinds of possessions. Don't take even two tunics. It seems to me that by two tunics, he is pointing to two sets of clothes. That is correct. He does not mean that in the frozen regions and in the glacial glacial snow of Scythia, a person ought to be content with a single tunic. Rather, by tunic, we should understand clothing. We should have one set of clothes and should not keep another. We should keep ourselves out of fear for the future. Now, can you imagine how that would work today? And of course, the monks live like this. The monks have... Uh, a vow, of course, of poverty, and they try to be detached from material possessions. But the rest of us have lots and lots of clothes, way too many clothes. Have you ever lived in a, a, a very old house, a house from the 1900s or from the early 1900s, from the 1800s? We've lived in houses like that in the East Coast. You go into the bedrooms and the closets are really, really tiny. There's enough for, you know, a few dresses or shirts and a few shirts and a couple pairs of pants. They're very, very small. And that's because people did not have as many clothes back in those days. They also had other places where they kept clothes in armoires and for, for example, but really this um, a sort of obsession over clothing and different styles of clothing and the availability of less expensive clothing is one of the reasons why so many people have lots and lots of clothes. We have clothes in our closets that don't fit us, that we've never worn, that we're keeping in case we lose weight, or maybe someday I will wear it. This really shows um, an attachment to material possessions in a way that the Lord wanted the disciples not to have, not to be concerned with such things. Of course, I think it helped that they were men <laughs> because, of course, women didn't care have as many clothes back then either. But this would be much more difficult uh, today to for people. They would consider this quite extreme, but people didn't have a lot of clothes. Do not take any sandals, he instructs them. And here is St. Jerome. Even Plato commands that the two extremities of the body are not to be covered, nor should they be accustomed to the softness of cap or shoes. For when these are tough, the other parts of the body are tougher. Don't take a staff. Well, since we have the Lord's help, why should we, eat the need, why should we seek the aid of a staff? He had sent the apostles to preach when they were stripped, so to speak, and unencumbered, so that the condition of the teachers seemed to be hard. Well, one of the things that he's getting at here is that the message of the apostles, the prepare for the kingdom of heaven, shows that urgency of the message. But more than that, their lack of attachment to material possessions encourages the same attitude toward material possessions in the people to whom they are preaching. In other words, they're not being hypocritical. Now he, he has tempered the severity of the command with the following judgment, saying, the worker is worthy of his food. In other words, don't 
be concerned about how you're going to provide for yourself because somebody will provide for you. Receive, he says, only as much as is necessary for yourselves by way of food and clothing. For this reason, the apostle also repeats this, have food and clothe, and we are content with these. Thus, the disciples reap spiritual things. They make their teachers sharers in their own material things. This is done not out of greed, but out of necessity. So does this remind you of anything we've already discussed in terms of the, uh, in terms of the gospel of St. Matthew? Remember when he talks about, don't be anxious about what you will wear or what you will eat. That's in the sermon on the Mount. He says, have no anxiety over these things. Your heavenly father knows that you need these things and he will provide for you. Remember that? So this was something that the Lord said, not only to the disciples going out to preach, but to everyone who was listening to his words. And we too, even if we're going to have more than a a few clothes in our closet, we're supposed to have a lack of anxiety about this. When we have a lack of anxiety, then this shows our dependence on God. Or if we don't have that, Uh, If we do have anxiety over these things, it shows a lack of trust in God and an attachment to the things of this life. Now let's hear what St. John Chrysostom says about this passage. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. See how he provides for their conduct, and that no less than their miracles implying that the miracles without this are nothing. Listen to that. What an amazing statement. He says that with even if they were to do miracles, without following this way of life, the miracles are nothing. They don't have any great meaning. So what was more important was how they lived their daily life. Thus he both quells their pride by saying, freely you have received, freely give and takes order for their being clear of covetousness. Moreover, lest it should be thought their own work, unless they be lifted up by the signs that were done, he means the miracles, so that they will not become puffed up by the amazing miracles that, that, they're, that is accomplished through the disciples. He said, freely you have received, freely give. You bestow no favor on them, that receive you for you did not receive these things for a price nor after toil for the grace is mine. So you can't be stingy with the grace of God because you didn't pay for it. In like manner, therefore give to them of also for there is no price worthy of them. You can't put a price on the grace of God. After this, plucking up immediately the root of the evils, what's the root of all evil? The love of money, not money, but the love of money. So after trying to root out the root of evils, he said, provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your purses nor money for your journey nor two coats or shoes or staff. He did not say, do not take them with you. But even if you can obtain them from another, flee from the evil disease. And you see that hereby he was answering many good purposes. So listen to all of the reasons that Chrysostom says, the Lord said, don't take any money, don't take any extra provisions for yourself, nothing. So here are the reasons. He enumerates quite a few of them. First, He was setting his disciples above suspicion. Now, what does he mean by that? What does he mean by that? Above suspicion. That people will not think that they are doing this for money. By the way, this is still, some people think this today. And sometimes it's true. Let's, Let's face it. There are religious leaders who are religious leaders, who are preachers. And they do this for money. They can have a very nice life. And unfortunately, people can present themselves as preachers of the gospel, and they can live a very lavish, very opulent life. 
because they are asking others for money. Of course, we've seen lots of scandals involving preachers. <coughs> Excuse me. Going back to like the 1980s, the Jim and uh, Tammy Faye Baker and Swaggart and others, there's plenty of others who became wealthy. Um, they don't necessarily begin this way. They begin uh, sincerely wanting to preach the word of God, wanting to help other people. And we've seen this. I was watching a podcast recently um, that was hosted by a an African-American Orthodox priest, and he had another African-American Orthodox Christian, and they were talking about how both of them had come from a Protestant background and how they had seen this, seen people who were full of zeal, who were you know, had the right kind of motivation initially. But once they become well-known preachers and established preachers in a congregation, they begin to live a very high life. And very often their congregation is in an inner city or is in a, a poorer neighborhood. And uh, they live, however, in a very nice house in a very nice part of town. They drive fancy cars. They wear fancy and expensive clothes. And they were commenting on how this may not have been what they intended, but they become corrupted by money. And uh, that's not very common. It's not common at all, I think, in, among the Orthodox. The clergy, our clergy, tend to live about the same, we could say, level, economic level, as the people of the congregation. But that's not always the case. In many Protestant congregations, they kind of expect that their uh, pastor will live above the, them in, in terms of their economic status, well above them. And they actually kind of take pride in that. They take pride in that. So let us continue here. <clears throat> so he, Chrysostom says that the Lord was setting his disciples above suspicion. Secondly, he was freeing them from all care that they might give all their leisure to the word. In other words, if you're if you don't have any concern for um, if you have no what, what, what am I trying to say here, if you're not concerned about material possessions, then you have more time to be thinking about preaching, right? Third, he is teaching them his own power that they're going to rely on him, of course. But perhaps some may say that the rest may not be unaccountable. But not to have money for the journey, neither two coats nor staff nor shoes, why did he require this? Being minded to train them up to all perfection, since even further back he had did not allowed them to take so much thought for the next day. Remember, that's what I was talking about. He said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will be anxious enough for itself. So if he's saying this, and this is very important here, because even though we call this the missionary discourse, nonetheless, this instruction is really for all of us to some degree, not just for preachers, because the same instructions, not to be concerned about tomorrow, not to, not to pile up money or to have too many clothes or, uh, have possessions so that, uh, moth and rust consume and thieves break in and steal. This lack of attachment to possessions is something that the Lord already warned all of us against and instructed all of us to, uh, to not um, be consumed by or pay attention to the lack of interest in material possessions. For even to the whole world, he was to send them out as teachers. <clears throat> Therefore, of men, he makes them even angels, so to speak, releasing them from all worldly care so that they should be possessed with one care alone, that of teaching, or rather, even from that, he releases them saying, take no thought for how you are to speak or what you are to say. We haven't come to that part of the missionary discourse yet, but he's telling them, He's giving them no concerns at all, but giving their focus entirely on the preaching of the word. And thus, what seems to be very grievous and galling, this he shows to be especially light and easy for them. For nothing makes men so cheerful as being freed from anxiety and care, especially when it is granted to them, being so freed to lack nothing, God being present and becoming to them 
instead all things. So all things become the, are the all things are the focus on God. God is all things for them, not any concern over material possessions. So this is St. John Chrysostom. Now at this point, Chrysostom discusses the difference between what is given by the apostles, when he says freely you have received, freely give, and the obligation of the receiver to provide for the gospels who are preaching, for the disciples rather, who are preaching the gospel. You see, because it's understandable maybe that uh, he said, well, don't have concern with material possessions. Well, we understand that. But if they're not to take any money, how are they going to provide even just for their basic necessities? So he wants them to be completely dependent on God and to know that others will provide for them. This is very important as well, that we are obligated to provide for the preachers of the gospel. <clears throat> so now he's, but listen to how he explains the difference. So they are not to expect any money for giving the grace of God. And yet they should expect that people will provide for them a place to stay and food. Here's St. John Chrysostom. Next, lest they should say, how then are we to obtain our necessary food? He did not say to them, you have heard that I told you before. Behold the fowls of the air, for they were not yet able to realize this commandment in their actions. Now, what is it we're talking about here? In earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, where he said, do you see the birds of the air? How they toil, nor how they, how uh, the, even your heavenly father feeds them or the flowers, right? The lilies of the field, how they neither toil nor spin, but Yet Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. Remember that? That's from the Sermon on the Mount. So he's already taught them that. He prepared them in that way, but they're not quite ready to live that kind of life. So he didn't say, don't worry about anything. Just like God takes care of the sparrows, uh, he will take care of you. Instead, he added, according to Chrysostom, what falls, fall, what falls far short of this saying, for the workman is worthy of his food, declaring that they must be nourished by their teaching, as though giving all and receiving nothing at their hands, nor these again break away as being despised by their teachers. In other words, they should be nourished by their disciples. In other words, the people that the disciples of the Lord teach, those are the disciples of the disciples, they should provide for them. After this, that they may not say, do you then command us to live by begging and be ashamed of this? He signifies the thing to be a debt, both by calling them workmen and by terming what was given hire for the workman is worthy of his hire for the worker is worthy of his hire. As that's a typical way that that was translated. And that means to be provided for, for his food, at least. For do not think, he said, because the labor is in words, that the benefit conferred by you is small. No, the thing has much toil. And whatever they that are taught may give, it is not a free gift which they bestow, but a recompense which they render. For the workman is worthy of his food. But this he said, not as declaring so much to be the worth of the apostles' labor, far from it, God forbid, but as making it a law for them to seek nothing more, and as convincing the givers that what they do is not an act of liberality, but a debt. So now he goes on to talk about where they should stay. Here we are in verse 11. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay with him until you depart. And as you enter the house, salute it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, Shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. So let's pause at this moment. And when we return, we'll talk about where they are supposed to stay and what instructions the Lord gives for that. Okay. Dr. Constantino will be back in a moment, but the lines are open for your calls. The number is 855-237-2346. 
That's 855-AF-RADIO. So here's a question for you. What does it mean to think orthodox? What are the unspoken and unexplored premises and presumptions underlying what Christians believe? Orthodox Christianity is based on preserving the mind of the early church, its thronima. Dr. Jeannie Constantino brings her more than 40 years experience as a professor, Bible teacher, and speaker to bear in explaining what the Orthodox phronema is, how it can be acquired, and how that phronema is expressed in true Orthodox theology, as practiced by those who are properly qualified by both training and a deep relationship with Christ. Thinking Orthodox, now available at store.ancientfaith.com. That's store.ancientfaith.com. back with Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantino. Have a question about the verses we are studying tonight? Give her a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Dr. Jeannie. Well, this is actually a pre-recorded lesson, so don't call in tonight. Some other time. All right, so now the Lord explains to them or gives them instructions about where they should stay because there, although there were inns, you needed money, right, to stay at an inn. <clears throat> and a lot of these little tiny towns, they didn't even have inns. Because that's the, where they were going to these little villages uh, throughout Galilee. And since he tells them not to have any money, they can't stay there. So now he gives them instructions about where they ought to stay. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay with him until you depart. As you enter the house, salute it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. So I'll I'll pause here one moment. When he says salute it, it means greet everybody in the house. Um, And the greeting was shalom, peace be with you. And that's why, of course, that's still the greeting in Israel, and the Arabs have something very similar, and so do the Ethiopians, they, they all say peace. So that's a typical greeting, and so that's why he says, salute it and let your peace, give it your peace. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Let's see, before we return to Chrysostom, let's take a look at at what Jerome says about this. St. Jerome. Upon entering a new city, the apostles were unable to know what the people would be like. Therefore, a host is to be selected by his reputation among the people and by the judgment of the neighbors. Isn't that interesting? You ask people, who should I stay with? And you try to find somebody who has a good reputation and stay with them. So you have to inquire, not just the first person you meet. This way, the dignity of the proclamation will not be disfigured by the ill repute of the one receiving it, Although they are to preach to everyone, one host is chosen. In other words, so first of all, he says, um, you you don't just ask anyone or the first person that you might meet or the first person who welcomes you because that person may not have a good reputation. And then that tarnishes the reputation of the preachers, right? Of those who are bringing the gospel message. And also, he says, even though they are to preach to everyone, they're not supposed to stay with everyone. They're supposed to choose one person. He does not give a benefit to him who is going to stay among them, but he receives one. For he says this, who it is in it is worthy. Thus the host knows that he is receiving a favor rather than giving one. So if the host is chosen, somebody says, I've heard that this, they've heard that this particular person, this family has a good reputation in the town, then this is something to, to receive the disciples is um, an honor for them 
because they have been found to be worthy. That's what the, the St. Jerome is getting at here. So here is St. John Chrysostom paraphrasing the Lord. Herein, I also require you to use much circumspection. They were supposed to use discernment in deciding where to stay. For this will profit you both in respect of your credit and for your very maintenance. For if he is worthy, he will surely give you food, more especially when you ask nothing beyond mere necessities. And he not only requires them to seek out worthy persons, but also not to change house for house, whereby they would neither vex him that is receiving them, nor themselves get the character of gluttony and self-indulgence. For this reason, he declared by them saying, remain there until you go from there. And this one may perceive from the other evangelists also. They all say the same thing. And not only was this the requirement um, the, of the Lord, this was followed in the early church as well. So here's how Chrysostom concludes this little statement. Do you see how he made them honorable by this also? And those that receive them careful by signifying that they are rather the gainers, both in honor and in respect of advantage. So he made them honorable by this also. In other words, he made the disciples honorable and also the person receiving them honorable. So they were not supposed to go from house to house. What house, when you find a house, when you go to a town, ask around and see who is worthy in it. And by this, he means somebody of good character, of good reputation, stay with them. Isn't it interesting? Um, he, they presume that the person would not say, no, you can't stay with us. They didn't have the kinds of, you know, fussiness that we have today with, well, my house isn't ready. Or it's, you know, I don't have a spare bedroom. People may do with a lot less. And also, you know, hospitality was considered one of the most important virtues in the Middle East. And it is in other parts of the world, including Greece, hospitality in ancient times was one of the most important things that you could do for someone. So we see this mentioned in the epistles of Paul and other apostolic epistles as well. So when he says, find a, a house that is worthy and then stay there for the entire time that you're at that house, don't be going that the entire time, rather, that you're at that town. Don't be switching from one place to the next because you will develop a bad reputation. So, for example, let's say you're invited and you're staying with a very poor family, but this person has a very good reputation as an honest man, as a humble man, as a very devout and pious man. And then later you meet a very devout, pious person who's a lot more wealthy and they can give you better food. You'll be tempted to go and stay with that family, or maybe the first family you stay with has seven or eight children. That's a lot of people in the house. These are very small houses. And yet um, you find out somebody invites you, why don't you come and stay with me? I don't have any children. Okay. My wife and I are childless. We have lots of room. You're not supposed to take them up on that offer because then it looks like you're as though the disciples would appear to be looking for better accommodations. This is what Chrysostom is getting at when he says that, that they should not do this because they would get the character of gluttony or self-indulgence. So whatever house they choose when they first arrive, that's where they're supposed to stay and not be moving. And we find that same instruction being followed by the disciples later um, in the early church. And this is the pattern that we see in the book of Acts. And this is why the church was established in houses, because wherever the apostle was staying, Paul, for example, that became the first house church. And he would stay there and people would have the meetings. And very often it wasn't necessarily the largest house, but that's where the apostle was initially. Okay. So now, whether or not someone accepted the peace, that is the greeting that was offered by the disciples, would determine whether or not they would stay in that house. So he says, salute the house and let your peace come upon it. So here's St. John Chrysostom. He says that 
that to see whether or not the peace would remain with the house. If it, if peace comes back to you, it's a very strange thing. How do you, cause we say, for example, we don't say peace. We, we say hello, right? Good morning. Something like that. It doesn't come back to us, but because the greeting both coming and going in Israel, for example, is Shalom. You say Shalom when you're leaving, when you're coming, when you see someone, and also when you're departing, you say Shalom. So, when you uh, when you greet someone, how would that come back to you? In other words, not be received. That's possible. In other words, you are offering them. You're not only greeting them. It's more than a greeting. It is a blessing. This is what Chrysostom says. So listen to St. John Chrysostom. Then implying that this is not a mere salutation, but a blessing, he says, if the house is worthy, it shall come upon it. In other words, somebody's going to accept the blessing of peace. But if it deal insolently, its first punishment will be not to have the benefit of your peace. And the second, that it shall suffer the doom of Sodom. Sodom is the epitome, of course, of evil. The uh, classic, well, Sodom and Gomorrah were the classic towns that were destroyed in the book of, uh, of Genesis for their tremendous um, sinfulness. So then if, if they don't accept the peace, you're supposed to shake the dust off your feet. When the Jews returned from foreign lands, they had a custom, some people say, of shaking the dust from their feet. And this was a symbolic rejection of paganism. Um, so that, so it's in other words, it's a way of saying, I don't want anything to do f- from with you. I will not even carry the dust from this town with me to the next town. So that's what it means. It doesn't mean that let, literally you shake your feet, you know, <laughs> it just means you don't take anything of that with you, of that town with you. So here's St. John Chrysostom about the warning that if they don't receive the disciples, it will go worse for them than it went the judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah. That's a pretty shocking thing. St. John Chrysostom, he said, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that city. So here again, when he said, you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake, that he hasn't come to yet. Um, for, for my sake, for a testimony to them and the Gentiles. And this is no small consolation. Now these things were a comfort to them, not that they desired the punishment of other people, but that they might have ground of confidence and sure to have him everywhere present with them who had both foretold and foreknown these things. And not because as wicked men and as pests, they were to suffer all these things. So in other words, if someone rejects you, it's not because there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with them. But why will the, because Chrysostom doesn't explain this here, why will the, uh, why will the judgment of that town be much worse than the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah? Can you figure it out? It's because that town received the gospel message and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah did not have the benefit of the gospel. They were long before the incarnation of Christ. Now, in this uh, particular homily, homily 32 on the Gospel of St. Matthew, St. John Chrysostom comments uh, surprisingly at length about how the clergy are treated. And I wanted to share this with you. I mentioned this to you last week. Um, It's a bit lengthy, but it's interesting. It's something for you to think about in terms of how you treat your own clergy that serve you. But I wanted to share it with you because we sometimes think about the fathers of the church. They're these, you know, obviously paragons of virtue, and we see them in icons and that sort of thing, stained glass windows. And we forget sometimes that they were ordinary people and things did not always go well with them either. So they could relate to the treatment that sometimes the the disciples received very bad treatment at the hands of these villages when they would go to a village. Nobody want them. People maybe chase them out or they didn't receive them. That's why the Lord is preparing them for this. So this prompts when he says, when you give your peace, let your peace remain with them. If they receive it, if they're worthy, they will receive it. If not, 
take it back or it will come back to you. In other words, they won't accept your greeting. They won't accept you. And so you should just leave. Notice that he doesn't say, just stay there and, and say, this is, uh, I'm here to bring you the good news, whether you like it or not. We don't see that. He does not tell them to insist on remaining there. Remember, we saw the Lord also when he went to the land of the Gadarenes and he healed the Gadarene demoniacs, the two men who were living in the tombs, who were um, so suffering from a demonic possession by many, many demons. When that incredible um, event occurred, that all of the demons were sent into the swine and the swine were destroyed by running down a cliff, the people of that town asked the Lord to leave their country immediately. And he did. He didn't argue with them. He didn't say, but you don't know who I am. You don't know what I could do for you. He didn't say, give me a chance. He just very uh, meekly and humbly left. He did what they wanted. So similarly, again, here, the Lord says, when you go to a town, if you find someone worthy, stay with them. If you're if they accept your peace, let it remain. If not, take it back. If they reject you, if they give you trouble, if the town does not accept you, just leave and don't worry about it. Have nothing to do with that town. This is what is meant by the expression, shake the dust off your feet. I don't know if they literally, maybe the Pharisees literally shook their feet when they came back from a journey because they wanted to show that they had nothing unclean, even uh, even the dust of a Gentile town. That's That's possible. I could see the the Pharisees doing that, but I don't think that the Lord necessarily meant for us to do that literally. But as I mentioned, um, and commenting on these verses, Chrysostom begins to talk about how he, as a pastor, as a priest, is sometimes not accepted and is rejected and um, undermined by people in the parish. And it was so striking, this sermon the way he talks about it, that I just wanted to share it with you. And I want you to realize that even the saints had were rejected by people. And of course, we know this. They were often um, harassed and they were misunderstood and they were slandered. We see this with a great many saints. And even the ones who were um, widely accepted in their own lifetime and recognized as saints, people like St. Paisios, a modern saint, even they had people who did slander them, who said things about them that weren't true. There was one, um, you know, Paisios was uh, clairvoyant. He was able, because of the grace of God within him, he knew people's names and their situation uh, in life before they ever came to see him. He knew that they were coming toward his Galivi, toward his little hut. He knew who they were. He knew what their problems were. This is the grace of God within the, the saint. But some people did not believe that. So there was apparently one um, electrical uh, engineering student from Thessalonica, the story is told, who uh, didn't believe that he really knew people's situation. And he figured that the saint had implanted listening devices along the path toward his Kalevi, toward his little hut in the, you know, on the mountain. And he was listening to people's conversations that he had some kind of receiver, some kind of device. Now this has actually happened, not with monks, okay. Or saints, but, but there have been uh, preachers, traveling preachers who have fooled people into thinking that they really understood or were receiving messages from God. And there was a famous guy, his name was Peter Popov and he used to travel all around and he had got a lot of money. He would go to big, uh, you know, uh, auditoriums. I remember because he was one of these te television evangelists during the 1970s. Um, and he would say, someone, someone in the congregation, someone in the audience here uh, needs to have back surgery. They're, they're scheduled to have back surgery next Monday in whatever town. So he would give, and then the person would say, wow, how did he know that? Well, that's because he had, it, this was discovered later. He had planted people in the audience and say, what are you here for? Well, I have back surgery. And then they, and he was wearing an earpiece. And then they were reporting back to him and saying, there's a person here who needs this and such. Or they were talking to them as they were in line waiting to go on. This is supposedly a faith healer. And uh, he was exposed for this. So it's not that that hasn't happened. So there was this particular um, 
uh, a student of electrical engineering in Thessalonica who thought that perhaps this was the case with St. Baesios. So he said there's probably some uh, transmitter on top of his little hut, and maybe he has hidden microphones around the area so he's able to hear people's conversations. <laughs> okay. So now he decided he would go there and try to find these devices. And, but he didn't tell anyone and he came alone. So it's not like he was speaking about it so that he could be overheard as he talked with someone as they were approaching uh, the monk's dwelling. So he was just thinking it in his mind. And as soon as he arrived, there was a large crowd of people waiting to see Paisios. And Paisios called him over by name, and he was shocked that he knew his name. And he took him aside and said, listen, there's a there's an antenna on the roof of my little hut. And in the woods, there's all these hidden electronic devices. Now, mind you, this young man hadn't said this to anyone. He hadn't told anybody of his suspicion or his plan to find these, what he thought were hidden electronic devices. And of course, the saint was teasing him. And this is how he realized this, but it, this can happen. Um, anyhow, I don't remember how I got onto this. Oh yes. So he was, but there were many other people who also said that Paisios was a fraud and things like this. So this happens sometimes. Now here's St. John Chrysostom about his experiences in his own congregation. So he was here when he was preaching this, he was a presbyter, a priest in Antioch. Mark, I ask you, how when he had stripped them of all, he stripped the disciples of everything, by allowing them to abide in the houses of those who became disciples and to enter therein having nothing. For thus they were both freed from anxiety, and they would convince the others that they have come only for their salvation, first by bringing in nothing with them, and then by requiring no more of them than necessaries. And lastly, by not entering all their houses without distinction, since not by the signs only did he desire them to appear illustrious, but even before the signs, by their own virtue. For nothing so much as characterizes the strictness of life as to be free from superfluousness, and so far as may be from wants. And this even the false apostles knew. So here he's alluding to the fact that St. Paul uh, had to fight against false apostles in Corinth. And in other words, people try to appear virtuous, but the Lord wanted the apostles to have this, uh, to be recognized as being virtuous by not seeking, by not carrying money, by not asking for things, by this, this was more important, frankly, than the miracles that they would perform. This is St. John Chrysostom. But if when we are in a strange country, and are going to persons unknown to us, we must seek nothing more than our food for the day, much more so when abiding at home. So if you if you should not be dependent, if you should be dependent upon the Lord for everything when you're traveling, much more so when you're living in your own town. This is what Chrysostom is saying. These things let us not only hear, but also imitate. For not all, for for not of the apostles alone are they said, but also of the saints afterwards. Let us therefore become worthy to entertain them. For according to the disposition of the entertainers, the, the people who are welcoming you, this peace both comes and flies away. So when you welcome someone, the peace comes into your house, but it, depending upon how you behave toward that person, the peace also departs. For not only on the courageous speaking of them that teach, but also on the worthiness of those who receive, this effect follows. So they may give you the peace, give you a blessing, but if you're not worthy to receive the blessing, you're not going to receive the blessing. And we should do all things so as to enjoy it, both at home and in church. For in the very church too, the presiding minister gives peace. And this is which this which we speak of is a type of that. So 
When does the presiding minister give peace? The proistaminos, the priest who is functioning during the divine liturgy says, peace be with you. That's an ancient part of the service. And this is seen in other churches as well. The liturgical churches have the pastor or the priest giving a blessing. It's peace be with you. And the response is, and with your spirit. And with thy spirit is the response. That is a very ancient part of the divine liturgy. And Chrysostom here is commenting on that, how the presbyters give their peace to the congregation, but that peace isn't always received by the congregation, or maybe only, you know, on a very superficial level. So this is what he's about to talk about. In the very church, too, the presiding minister gives peace, and this which we speak of is a type of that, and you should receive it with all alacrity, that's quickness, in heart before the actual communion. For if not to impart it after the communion be disgusting, how much more disgusting to repel from you the one who pronounces it. <clears throat> so here he's about to talk about how um, his even though he's blessing them, they often reject him. This is quite interesting. As a matter of fact, so we will not have to break it up in the middle. Let's take a pause right here and come back after the break, and we will read St. John Chrysostom's words about his own experience in his congregation. Join me after the break. Dr. Constantinou will be back in a moment, but the lines are open for your calls. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Ancient Faith Publishing is pleased to announce a new release that is part history, part theology, and part devotional. The Story of Jesus, A History and Theology of Christ explores the complete life and teachings of our Lord from before His conception in Mary's womb until His ascension. Revered 20th century Egyptian elder and scholar Matthew the Poor wrote many volumes on the subject of Christ's significance, life, and teachings, which translator James Helmy has distilled into one highly readable book that will make a valuable addition to every Christian's library. The Story of Jesus is now available in paperback and ebook at store.ancientfaith.com. That's store.ancientfaith.com. We are back with Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. Have a question about the verses we are studying tonight? Give her a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Dr. Jeannie. So I'm reading to you from Homily 32 on the Gospel of Matthew, St. John Chrysostom's Homily, on this part about the uh, how the disciples were to give their peace to the person in the house and if the person was worthy, they would receive it. And Chrysostom is mentioning how presbyters during the divine liturgy, he says, in this house, and he's referring to the church, because this is he's preaching before a live audience. Sometimes we give our peace, and when we give our peace to you, you should receive it, okay? You shouldn't receive it after communion, but before communion, you should receive the peace. And um, he begins to talk about his own experience. And it's not that this in particular illuminates the meaning of the gospel passage, but I found it so unusual that he should talk so personally about his own experiences that I wanted to share it with you. So here is St. John Chrysostom. For you, the presbyter sits. For you, the teacher stands, laboring and toiling. What plea then will you have for not affording him so much welcome as list to listen to him? In other words, you're you're not, not only not welcoming him, you're not even listening to him. For indeed, the church is the common home of all. And when you have first occupied it, we enter in, strictly observing the type which they exhibited. For this cause, we also pronounce peace in common to all directly as we enter according to that law. So here's what he's he's talking about. First of all, he's comparing the church, the building to a house. And he's saying, you're already inside of it. Then we come in and then we offer you peace. So what is he talking about? You know, the, um, small entrance when the, the, uh, 
clergy come in and they bring in what come in with the gospel from the sanctuary and they make that little trip from the altar with the gospel through the north door and then they stand in front of the iconostasi originally that was them entering from outside the church and uh Everybody was waiting for them to enter the church, and they would enter with the gospel, that small entrance, the lesser entrance. This is what he's talking about. So it's as though everybody was already at the house, the Christians were already in the church, and then we, the clergy, would enter it. That's why he's seeing the comparison. Do you see that? Between the disciples going to somebody's house and offering peace. Is their peace accepted, or is it thrown back at them? Okay, this is what he's talking about. For this cause, we also pronounce peace in common to all directly as we enter according to that law. He doesn't mean really a law. He's saying this is the custom that we come in. You're already in the house. And then when after we come in, we give you peace. We give you a blessing. Let no one therefore be careless. No one inattentive when the priests have entered in and are teaching for there is really no small punishment appointed for this. Yes, and I, for one, would rather enter into any one of your houses 10,000 times and find myself baffled than not be heard when I speak here. This latter to me is harder to bear than the other, but how much this house is of greater dignity. Obviously, the church is a much more important than somebody's individual house. So he says that when he comes and people and he's preaching and people aren't paying attention, this is impossible for him to bear because it's so important. What's he, what he's teaching them is so important. And yet there people are not paying attention. So think about this with your own pastor and how often he's preaching or teaching or reading the gospel and you're not paying attention. But since we fall short of the apostles virtue, and dwell scattered in our several homes. Let us at least, when we meet here, be earnest in doing so, because though in all other things we are destitute and poor, yet in these we are rich. Wherefore, at least here, receive us with love when we come in to you. And when I say, Peace be with you, and you say, With thy spirit, Say it not with the voice only, but also with the mind, not in mouth, but in understanding also. Did you ever think about that when the priest comes out and blesses you? And then we all, you're in the choir or the congregation sometimes bows to receive the blessing. Are you really wishing the priest peace? Are you really trying to give a blessing back to him? Is it, as it were, obviously you can't bless him the way he blesses you, but do you mean it? When he says, peace be with you, and you say, and with your spirit, um, do you really mean it? And Chrysostom is saying you should really mean it when your priest blesses you. You should receive that blessing and respond with a real intention that he also receive peace, that he also be blessed. But if well here you say, peace also to thy spirit, and out of doors you are my enemy, spitting at and calumnating me, and secretly slandering me with innumerable reproaches, what manner of peace is this? Are you doing that to your priest? Are you saying, and with your spirit, and then behind the scenes in the hall, or on the telephone, or in, the, in emails with others, you're slandering your priest, or you're saying something against him? What kind of peace is that? That's full of hypocrisy. For I indeed, though you speak evil of me, 10,000 times, I give you that peace with a pure heart, with sincerity of purpose, and I can say nothing evil at any time of you, for I have a father's heart. And if I rebuke you at any time, I do it out of concern for you. But as for you, by your secret carping at me and not receiving me in the Lord's house, I fear lest you should in return add to my despondency, not because of your insulting me, not for your casting me out, but for your rejecting our peace 
and drawing upon yourself that grievous punishment. What was the punishment for rejecting the peace? The Lord said, the people who don't receive you, those are the disciples, it will go worse for them on the judgment day than it did for Sodom and Gomorrah. So Chrysostom is concerned about the congregation um, not receiving his peace, the blessing that he's offering. And then he's, even though with their mouths, they say, and with thy spirit, he get open of Matisse, they're responding in Greek. He's giving, uh, you know, Irini Pasi, he's saying to them, and they're responding, get open of Matisse. They don't really, some of them don't really mean it. It's quite remarkable. And so he says, you speak of evil of me 10,000 times. I'm not speaking evil of you. And I really am sincerely wishing you peace and giving you a blessing. But not only are you not receiving it, but you're going to be judged for that. This is a very serious matter. Are you surprised that Chrysostom had people who were so critical of him? Because we can't imagine that people were critical, but they were. Because in so many ways, they are exactly like people are today. They say, oh, the priest, he's too strict. Chrysostom, of course, was strict on himself, but he was also concerned with the salvation of their souls. And he was very direct in what he was preaching to them, the very direct in telling them, not to live like people in the world, very direct about giving to the poor, about, about uh, stopping, the, uh, stopping their lusts and all these other things that they were doing. So we know how he preached to them, and he did it out of love and pastoral care. But they were slandering him be, behind his back. Of course, he knew about it. Let's continue with Chrysostom. For though I do not shake off the dust, and though I turn not away, what is threatened remains unchanged. So he's saying, you know, I don't reject you. I don't leave. I don't shake the dust off my feet. I don't turn away from you. And yet the Lord said that the people who reject you, who don't accept your blessing, who don't accept your peace will be judged severely on the day of judgment. He says that part doesn't change because that's what the Lord said will happen. He doesn't have any control over that. For I indeed oftentimes pronounce peace to you, and I will not cease from continually speaking of it. And if, besides your insults, you do not receive me, even then I do not shake off the dust. Not that I am disobedient to our Lord, but because I vehemently burn for you. And besides, I have suffered nothing at all for you. I have neither come on a long journey, nor with that garb and that voluntary poverty have I come, therefore we blame ourselves, nor without shoes and a second coat. Perhaps this is why you also fail on your part. (laughs) Now, he was a monk. He didn't have a lot of possessions. He didn't have possessions at all, but he's saying, I'm not like the apostles. They were traveling. I I live here. I haven't suffered for you. But uh, notice how he's blaming himself. Maybe that's my fault. Maybe it's because if I was living more like the apostles and I didn't have an extra set of clothes, you would uh, accept me. Perhaps this is why you fail on your part. However, this is not sufficient plea for you. But while our condemnation is greater to you, it imparts no excuse. So Chrysostom is saying, even though maybe I'm deserving of of condemnation because I'm not living like the apostles, because I have more than one set of clothes. It's still not an excuse for you. Now look how seriously he's taking this. And it's, it's not personal in the sense that his feelings are hurt and he wants them to make him feel better. He again is concerned for their salvation because he's worried about the fact that people who do not accept the gospel message are going to be judged more severely than Sodom and Gomorrah. So he's worried about his con- his congregation and how, although with their lips, they say, and with your spirit, he says, peace be with you. They say with your spirit, they don't mean it because behind the scenes, outside of the church, they're speaking against him. And they're, rege- and they're also criticizing what he says. And remember, he's preaching the gospel. They're criticizing what he's saying about the gospel. Then the houses were churches, but now the church has become a house. Listen to this, though, not in a good sense. Then one might say nothing worldly in the house. People were speaking about the kingdom of God. They were speaking about uh, matters concerning salvation in the houses. 
There were, they were not speaking about anything worldly. But now one may say nothing spiritual in a church. So he's being sarcastic here. Because people were coming to church and they were carrying on conversations, worldly conversations. So he's not t- he doesn't mean it literally, but he's, uh, he's criticizing them for the kind of conversations that they have in church. So I'll say it again and you can listen to what he says. Then one may say nothing worldly in a house. Now one may say nothing spiritual in a church. But even here you bring in the business from the marketplace. And while God is discoursing, you abandon listening in silence to his sayings and bring in the contrary things and make discord. And I with that, it, and I would, that at least it were your own affairs. So at least he says, well, maybe I could understand it if you're talking about your own business, your own problems, your own concerns, but you're talking about things that have nothing to do with you. You're gossiping. Okay. And I would that at least if it were your own affairs, but now the things which have nothing to do with you, those are what you both speak of and hear. (laughs) What amazing thing. So you see, people haven't changed all that much, have they? All right. So people are coming to the church. The preacher is preaching or the gospel is being read and people are talking. In the congregation, they're carrying on their private conversations. So remember when when St. Paul says women should be silent in the churches, Chrysostom knew that this was a habit, especially of women, to be talking in church. And so he actually says that when Paul says to be silent, he's not saying that they shouldn't prophesy because he knows, he's he's already said, St. Paul has already said, when you we prophesy, when women prophesy in the church, they should cover their heads. And he assumed that they're speaking in tongues. They're, they're performing these functions in the church. So he says, when St. Paul says that women should be silent, he means they should not be carrying on conversations. This was a problem, clearly. And he's concerned about it, not simply from a, a, ma- a matter of the fact, from a decorum of because they weren't showing reverence, that's bad enough. Not only because of the fact that when people are carrying on conversations in church, they're disturbing everyone around them who's trying to focus on the service. It's more than that. He's concerned about their salvation because God is speaking, not the priest, not the reader. God is speaking to you and you don't care. You'd rather be talking about not even your own concerns, your own business. You're talking about other people and their business. Like so... So clearly he had plenty of experience in that. This is a this is Antioch. This is a big congregation. He was preaching at the largest church, what was called at that time the Great Church, because it was the largest church. And it was a very big congregation. It was an urban congregation, a very diverse congregation. So let us continue uh, with his words. For this I lament and will not cease lamenting. For I have no power to quit this house, but here we must remain until we depart from this present life. (laughs) He didn't know, but he was about to be, or soon he would be kidnapped, literally kidnapped and taken to Constantinople to become the Archbishop of Constantinople. But he figured that he was going to be with them for the rest of his life. Here we must remain until we depart from this present life. This we also seek of you, even love that fervent and genuine affection. But if you cannot endure even this, at least love yourselves and lay aside your present carelessness. This is sufficient for our consolation. In other words, if you don't care about me, that's fine. At least care about yourself and your salvation. This is enough for me. Now, the way he's talking about it, it makes it sound like nobody liked him, but of course, He had many people who adored him. He was greatly, greatly loved, um, both in Antioch and later in Constantinople. So most of the people loved him, but plenty of people did not like him because he said the truth and people don't want to hear the truth. And the clergy who may be listening to this know exactly what I'm talking about. People don't want to hear the truth. And the clergy are saying the truth, not for their own sake, but for the benefit, for the salvation of of the congregation. But people don't want to hear it. So they'd rather get rid of the preacher, get rid of the priest that was giving them this message of salvation. And so that they won't be forced to listen to the truth about themselves and what they need to do for their spiritual lives. So he says, listen, if you don't 
If you don't love me, that's fine. At least love yourselves and lay aside your present carelessness. In other words, be attentive when you come to church. Pay attention in church. Don't be careless. This is sufficient for our consolation. If we see you approving yourselves and becoming better men, so will I also myself show forth increased love, even though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. For indeed, there are many things that bind us together. So he's talking about what they have in common. So maybe they're thinking, oh, you're, you're the priest. You're up there on the pulpit. You have nothing in common with us. But now he's talking about how in many ways he is one of them. There are many things that bind us together. He says, one table is set before all. What does he mean? The altar. There's one altar in an Orthodox church. We don't have multiple altars. One altar. One divine liturgy. One loaf. One common cup, one communion cup. And this is what he's talking about. These are uh, the reason why the church uh, did this from the beginning is so that the congregation would be unified. It's a symbol of the unity of the church and of the congregation, individual congregation. One table is set before us all. One father begat us. We are all of the same issue. The same drink has been given to all, or rather not only the same drink, but the same drink has been given out of the one cup. For our Father, desiring to lead us to a kindly affection, has devised this also, that we should drink of the one cup, a thing which belongs to intense love. But, you might say, there is no comparison between the apostles and us. I confess it too, and would never deny it. For I say not only to themselves, but not only Even to their shadows are we comparable. But nevertheless, let your part be done. This will have no tendency to disgrace you, but rather profit you all the more. For when, even to the unworthy persons, you show much love and obedience, then you shall receive the greater reward. He's alluding to what is said at the end of the missionary discourse when he says, you know, even if you give a cup of water, he's going to talk about that to someone, you'll have your reward. So he's saying, at least if you don't love us, at least behave properly, at least accept what we are telling you, at least listen to the words of the Lord, and this will go better for you. You will receive some reward. Now, I would like to continue, but we're going to stop at this point because what he's about to talk about here, what comes next, actually quite uh, interesting. Um, He anticipates the congregation's comments on why they do not behave better. They're giving excuses to him, of course, just like we give excuses to ourselves and to our pastors and to our spiritual fathers. We're not supposed to excuse ourselves, but there's a tendency to do that. They're saying that, well, we would behave better if we saw the miracles that the apostles did for the people who, to whom they preached. And Chrysostom is not about to accept that excuse. And he explains why the miracles were done in abundance back then in the time of the apostles. But it's a rather long passage. So I'm going to stop at this point. We will pick up with this uh, description and this explanation of why we're not excused from following all of these instructions that were given by the Lord to his disciples. And those also come to us. They're not just for the disciples, but they're also for us not to have attachment to worldly things and how it's no excuse to us that we did not see many miracles the way people did in apostolic times. And we'll hear what Chrysostom says about that next week. So join me at that time, won't you? And now let's close with our prayer. Lord, now let your servants depart in peace according to your word. For our eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to enlighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Amen. Good night. Welcome to Eastern Christian Insights with Father Philip Lamasters. Homilies from St. Luke Orthodox Church in Abilene, Texas. 
Father Philip is a professor of religion and the director of the honors program at McMurray University. Here he is with today's homily. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Christ is risen.